locked down, our very way of life suspended. But do not be alarmed by what you see, by these lonely buildings, these quiet roads. Yes, there's fear. Yes, there is panic. But do not be alarmed. Because as we speak, humanity is taking a stand by taking a step back. Even as you're listening to this, with the promise that Izozula land and we will meet again. We will do the things that matter with the people we love again. We will go back to our favorite spots and we'll even discover new ones. Shy around and go places we always said we would. We will travel again and we will gather again. Sikon zefut. But for now, kasena sbaka. Because for us all to travel tomorrow, we have to stay home today. But here's one thing I can promise you. No maganjani. We will make it through this. This epidemic will pass. If we act together, if we act now, we will overcome it. Start. Uh... Let me say on behalf of Turquoise Harmony Institute and our board of directors and uh, directors from the other branches from Cape Town and Durban, uh, I really appreciate your presence here and accepting our invitation to talk about, uh, from our side, it's a very important topic, uh, but nowadays because too much is happening for many of us, maybe social cohesion is not the priority at the moment. But I think focusing on uh, an issue uh, which unites us, uh, because we need to focus on things uh, which unite us rather than the, you know, the apart us. That's why uh, I think it is, from our perspective, very crucial and critical to talk about and discuss about the, the possible impact of uh, this pandemic on social cohesion and also uh, the importance of social cohesion, how to overcome uh, this kind of uh, pandemic. The, the first time I think all of us, you know, going through in our lives. So we've been through many difficulties, but I think with this kind, it is the first time. Uh, and again, uh, I would like to welcome all of you as panelists and our other guests and visitors uh, from different parts of the world. So we have very prominent uh, panelists here. I would like to introduce them shortly. Uh, their series are very long, but I just want to briefly introduce them to you. Uh, first of all, Dr. Raj Gavinde, uh, welcome and thank you very much for being part of the panel. Uh, and he's a social uh, anthropologist and community activist. Uh, he was a director uh, at the Arts, of, uh, Arts and Culture Department in uh, KwaZulu Natal. And he has been appointed by the Minister of Arts and Culture as a social cohesion advocate. So he's been uh, doing many community work. He received many uh, awards for his work. Uh, and we really, Looking forward to hear from you about, you know, your input about uh, the topic tonight. And welcome, Shebnam uh, Palesa Mohammed. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. You also welcome, and thank you very much. And she's a, a award-winning activist, journalist, radio producer, and presenter. I also follow her uh, sometime on the radio, and she's a, a attorney. Uh, and she's also managing an arts college in Durban, and she's the editor of Umandla uh, platform for the women. Thank you, Shabnam, uh, and welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and the next panelist is Rakni Bikru. She is a psychologist, motivational speaker, and mental health advocate with over 10 years of experience I think you are the one everybody is looking for uh, nowadays, Raki. Uh, and thank you very much. She has been uh, on 
television and the radio channels and she's giving daily advices on uh, how to cope with the you know the current pandemic in our lives thank you and welcome thank you thank you for the invite uh, and the next panelist is uh, Dr. Motamang Diaho. She is a qualified medical doctor by profession, uh, but she worked at the Nelson Mandela Foundation for six years, and he, she headed the dialogue program uh, at Nelson Mandela Foundation. And this is where her work in building social cohesion really was born. Uh, and she's a fellow of the Africa Leadership Initiative and one of the co-founders of uh, Teach SA. Uh, and yes, I'm sorry I miss uh, Catherine is here also. Welcome. Thank you. I don't know if I need to introduce you. Uh, I think uh, almost everybody knows you. And she's uh, an international climate activist, human rights defender, trailblazer and the agent of change. She's very active everywhere, every parts of the society and social media, I'm sure many of us follow uh, following her. Uh, and she's a 2013 Archbishop Tutu African Oxford Fellow and 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow. Kathleen's commitment and passion for social change takes her to the smallest of the communities in South Africa, as well as global platforms, including the UN, where she currently works as a human rights defender actively engaging in Geneva at UN, Human Rights Council for the world's most marginalized and the vulnerable. Thank you very much, uh, all the panelists. And we, again, uh, appreciate your uh, presence here and your time. Uh, I would like to uh, leave it to Iman. I don't have to introduce Iman at all. Uh, she's a prominent, uh, lovely, uh, friendly, uh, and the smartest journalist in South Africa. Uh, it's over to you, Iman. Uh, looking forward to hear and the very discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ihan, and welcome to all of our panelists. I think uh, some of my colleagues will take exception to that last introduction. Um, there are so many hardworking amazing journalists in our country and I'm honored to be in their ranks and I'm really honored to be on this panel um, this evening. And I, I guess the most important objective for me is in this discussion, what we take out that we can actually use practically in our society in a time of great change. Because if we reflect on our history, it's not been too long since we first breathed the winds of change in our country. There's really only a quarter of a century that stands between us and a time of great suffering in South Africa. And sometimes it feels like time is moving too fast and at other times as if time has stubbornly stood still. There's an old African proverb that goes, truth and mourning become light with time. And at no other point in our history are truth and time more relevant for us in South Africa because nature is speaking. She is in this moment warning and waiting for us to stop, to, con to confront, to consider, to imagine a new way of existing and for us to change. The question is, will we and can we? How is our reality in this country and in many places around the world being altered irrevocably? In the context of the great class divides in our country, more starkly than anywhere else in the world, and we all know well where our inequality levels are, how much more does this moment widen the chasm, show our injustice more acutely than before? And what can we do about it tonight? So it is a real pleasure to join the forum and have a real conversation about where to next, uh, and what do we do? You've introduced our illustrious panel. I'm really going to leave it up to them to shape this discussion tonight. And I think the most important um, invitation I can give each of them, starting with Dr. Rajendran Govender, is to really set the scene from your perspective how this moment of lockdown is in many ways showing up these inequalities even more starkly. Um, and from your perspective, what are some of the biggest lessons emerging from your observation of how we are evolving through this process? So Dr. Govinda, I'll invite you to open up the floor and take five minutes, please, to make your opening remarks. 
Okay, thank you very much, Iman, and, and, and welcome to all the other colleagues. It's an absolute delight being on this platform to talk about something that's so serious. Um, this global pandemic has really, really uh, touched our vital nerves and it made us realize how important we are as humanity. Now, I would like to look at this pandemic in three different ways. Firstly, from a medical point of view, it is creating so much of panic and it's creating so much of destruction worldwide where institutions and so on cannot cope with the influx of people, especially in America, Italy, Great Britain, and so on. It's, first, it's slowly infiltrating into Africa. The figures in South Africa may seem very low right now, but it is increasing and therefore there's great panic amongst many people in the medical fraternity. Uh, so, so from that point of view, from a medicine point of view, where they do not have a vaccine right now, and that is all the more concern that the global pub, uh, you know, uh, community are very worried about. Then from the second point of view, the economic point of view, the, the lockdown that has been introduced in most of the countries, including South Africa, is really impacting on the economy of the country. And, and for example, in India, the numbers are low now, but if they start testing, and if the numbers increase drastically, then obviously they have to do, they have to have much more stringent measures to cope with this. And when that happens, India is already uh, registering negative figures in the GDP. So what will happen, the country will be really crippled. Uh, econo economically. Now, the, from an economic point of view, that is creating panic. But from a social point of view, right, and this is why today we are, are able, through uh, artificial intelligence and through technology, we are able to communicate with people from our home. So, so basically, I found that during this period uh, uh, of the lockdown, more and more people have become aware of the importance of humanity. If you follow Facebook, WhatsApp, and the messages, apart from all those uh, fake news and everything, but there are some very, very good messages that are going, where people are praying in all religious denominations, where people are supporting each other, where people are reaching out, embracing each other. And, and, and that is so, so very important. So, so from those three perspectives, we have to look at this. Uh, but because today our focus is on social cohesion versus COVID-19, uh, it is a clear indication that we as humanity need to reach out, embrace each other and find solutions, not only for now, but going forward. Because the ramifications of the, the uh, coronavirus post after they find the cure and everything is going to be very, very, so from that point of view, I, I, I've seen this thing from a three-pronged three approach. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Governor. Really appreciate that. We'll get into, for everyone who's participating, and I'm, I'm so glad to see that the numbers are increasing with every moment. We've got 63 participants from around the world. So I really appreciate all of you. I want you to feel really welcome and part of this discussion. Make some notes as we go along. You're welcome to interact on the Q&A and on the chat. I'll pick up those questions. Just make sure you direct it to a particular panelist. Or if you just want to make a general comment, I'm quite happy to share that um, with the team. So once more, warm welcome to you and being part of this conversation. Shavnam, shall we throw the microphone your way? Sure. Uh, thank you. Welcome also to the panelists, viewers. And thank you, Iman, for, I think, setting a very important context for this particular discussion so that it's concrete and it's substantial. Um, I wanted to quote Arundhati Roy. Uh, in a piece you recently wrote, which went viral, calling the, you know, the pandemic has become the portal. And I've just lost it now because I was trying to do the Facebook Live. But here's another quote from her. And she's, of course, a feminist academic activist. And she says, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. And that's absolutely the opportunity that we have now. 
um, to create a new world and a world that we want. When I think of social cohesion, I think of those lovely um, words like unity and freedom and diversity and peace. But of course, in order to achieve that, we have to root it in what we call social solidarity. And that is the kind of approach that South Africans are taking, which is social solidarity. And what does that mean? It means standing with each other through this crisis. It means being honest about the challenges that we are experiencing, which this pandemic is laying starkly to bear in front of the whole world, which is making people feel depressed and anxious and angry and worried about their very futures, uh, the majority of the country that is. And what's great about it, in as much as there is so much suffering, there's people that are hungry, there's people that are homeless. I was in conversation yesterday on my show with the founder of Abahlali Basim Jondolo talking about shack dwellers being evicted in the Tegwini municipality every two days since this lockdown, despite a moratorium against evictions. And what he said in that very painful conversation was that we need to find our humanity. It means standing with each other through this crisis. So much suffering. There's people that are hungry. All right, I'm not sure what happened with the signal there. Um, I think that Chubnam was still speaking, so I'd like for her to continue, if that is possible. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and that's exactly what someone who is a shack dweller or a former shack dweller is saying, is that we need to find our humanity. And so that's a very important lesson for us to be able to stand with each other through this massive crisis that we're experiencing as a country and the world. And what is really also very important is the kind of solidarity we are seeing amongst people. I'm part of the C19 um, coalition uh, that is, you know, working in solidarity in different fields from food to healthcare to education and very importantly to monitoring human rights abuses. These are activists from every community in South Africa working around the country, around the clock to organize ourselves, to not just have a dependency on government and say, but what can we do? But actively creating the kind of world that we want. And for me, this is the most important outcome of this crisis. And I don't think our country or our world will ever be the same again. That's for sure. I mean, a lot of the literature that we are reading, I think even beyond the literature is this lived experience that we're all having that is leading us to conclude that we will be changed irrevocably after all of this is, is over, if it will even be over, because we live with the consequences, especially the economic impact. I mean, those seismic effects persist for a longer time ahead. What I'm really interested in is perhaps a perspective that uh, Rocky Bikram can bring to the conversation right now. From your perspective, how are you distilling things from a psychological psyche perspective? I know just being at home with my family, um, in the silence, having to self-confront, to think about my place in the world, how I feel about myself, you know, conversations that I haven't had with myself for a very long time. And I'm hearing other people echo that sentiment. From your perspective, what are some of the shifts and important observations you're making? I think what's so interesting, Iman, is that now that we can't go out, we're forced to turn inwards. Even those of us who've never introspected before are forced to introspect. Uh, and it's interesting to see what we're coming up with. Even though we're social distancing, I think we're more emotionally connected than we've been. And we're seeing this unity in our thoughts and uh, we're able to empathize a lot more if we weren't able to do it before. Even as a psychologist, for the first time, I see patients and we're going through the same thing. You know, generally we're helping people and we haven't, we don't experience it, we're able to empathize. But for the first time, we're helping people with things that we're experiencing ourselves. So there's a lot of shared feelings. So the anxiety is shared. Uh, anxiety at this time is not even necessarily irrational. So a lot of the anxiety that we're feeling is very irrational. There's the fear of this uncertain future about the cause of the pandemic, about what is going to happen, how long this is going to last. And the idea about normality, and you very rightfully say that we're not going back to the normality that we knew. For now, none of us know what we're going back to, but for sure it's never going to be what we were used to. In fact, it might actually be quite sad if we did go back to the normal that we did know. I think now we have a chance to think about things and think about ways in which we need to improve our lives. We've learned over the past few days that many things we thought we could not live about, without, we actually are living without. So we can live with so much less and I think we're also more conscious about what other people more aware of what other people are going through and knowing what we don't want back in our life but the way in which we are going to change and change for the positive going forward 
Thank you so much for those. Appreciate um, that perspective. Again, it's an issue we're going to tease out a little bit later on because it is something I think more immediately, along with the economic impact that a lot of families are experiencing, that ability to, to make sense of the now, to make sense of some of the developmental changes or the incremental changes are things that families are dealing with and it's a real shock to the system. Catherine uh, Constantinidis, I'd, I'd like to invite you to share your perspective as well on a world that is changing and how these are impacting our ability to, to, to emerge or, or to cleave together as a society cohesively in a time of, well, physical separation, because I think the social separation we've managed to get over a little bit. We can communicate on social media, we can communicate wirelessly, um, but in terms of that physical distancing, maybe to share from your perspective what you're seeing. I think that, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting time and we're all going through something that we've never been through before. And as said previously, we're going to enter a new phase and a new journey of uncharted waters where there is no normal. We're not going back to something. We're going to be moving forward to something that's very, very different. When we look at the world, you know, from my perspective, being a climate activist and having worked within the environmental space, I saw some photos today a little bit earlier of Johannesburg and the city and the skyline of Johannesburg is crystal clear. And it's amazing how the earth has also needed a break from the humans and I think that we we don't understand the kind of impact that we have on the earth that we live on uh, every single day we live in such a fast-paced world and life that we don't understand the, the huge, huge impact we're having on the earth. And so I think that this time is also a healing time for the earth and I think that that is something that's really important. And being at home and being able to connect, thank goodness for technology, because imagine if we didn't have access to cell phones, WhatsApp, video calls. Um, I think it would be a much lonelier lockdown period, but it really does allow one to think, it allows one to reflect internally as my previous um, panelists have said, but it also allows for us to start to think, how do we build community when we're apart? How do we engage as individuals in our individual capacity? What are we doing to build a community from the very spaces that we're in? We're in lockdown. We have platforms available to us. And fake news aside and all of the fun and games that you, know, you can uh, find on, on social media, on your iPad, laptop, cell phone, how is it that we're using our platforms to really build solidarity amongst us? What is it that we're doing in our own lives to build networks and communities around us during this time, be it communities of people that share the same interest, the same kind of work? What is it that we're doing on, on, a, on a daily basis to try to really build community? And I think that's something that we have to also give time and thought to because this lockdown may very well be extended and our lives will never be the same. And over and above that, this virus that has affected the world over will create some kind of a pain that we move forward into this unknown territory as well, because people will be directly affected by people that they know that either got the virus, that died from the virus, our country, now more than ever, I'm seeing a kind of solidarity within South Africa where we're understanding the needs of the most vulnerable people within our communities. You see the food drives that are going on, getting very basic essentials to homeless people. And I think for the first time, we're actually understanding how affected South Africans are by poverty because we're now understanding that if we are stuck in one place, what does it mean for the next person? Because as Dr. Govinda started and he said, what is our humanity? And how are we actually connecting to that humanity to try and ask ourselves personally, what is it that I do when I am out there in the world? What is it that I do on a daily basis from the corner that I sit on? And how am I actually building the very community I come from. And that community is defined how you wish to define it. It is a community based on your, your interests, your work. But we have to start to ask ourselves these kinds of questions because coming out of this lockdown period, whenever that may be, 
we're going to have a very, very difficult reality to deal with. And we're going to have to answer very hard questions as South Africans, as individuals, as breadwinners for our families. We're going to have a lot of work that needs to be done. So this time should really be about reflection, about building ourselves up, even though it's a mentally very difficult space and time we find ourselves in. We need to understand that our country will need us more than ever before, especially because of the pain and the reality of what this is doing to people on the ground. Catherine, thank you for those uh, compelling words. I think one of the most important things that I'm, I'm lifting out of that is the concept of this virus being the great equalizer and unequalizer, if, if, if I can use that term, because it's an equalizer in the sense that no one is immune from contracting the virus, but at the same time, those who do, who are coming from a context of already great struggle, uh, poverty, being disadvantaged, it only heightens that disadvantage. Whereas those who are in classes that are perhaps more well padded are better able to deploy resources to deal with either the way they convalesce, their access to medicine and their access to healthcare. And these are really important schisms I think that we need to talk about as our conversation progresses. One of the most important attributes of our next speaker's perspective, I think, is her concept of lifestyle being the real medicine. And Dr. Motamang Diao, I'd love to welcome you to share your perspective. Um, and, and I think also even from a, from a medical perspective, what this virus, COVID-19, is, is showing us in these very early days here in South Africa. Yeah. Thank you, Imani. I think I'd really like that question about what has it shown up? And I realized, I think all of us are on different global WhatsApp groups and all of that, but I think one of the biggest lessons that came out for me in, in so far as what has this virus shown us is that it was always going to be about the weakest link. And for me, there are two in this country. It is the chasm of the two worlds that we the last two weeks on our television screens, there's never been a part and a time for me as a public health specialist that I've seen our society so glaringly, glaringly separate in terms of how this virus is going to impact on the poor. It doesn't matter all the, the actions we have. And I must say, before I forget to say this, I think when I saw a little bit of the BBC statement on Cyril Ramaphosa was, has, has, has really shown serious leadership in how he has reacted in South Africa in, in, in general, how they have re reacted and, and stepped up to this challenge. It's just something that we need to bear in mind. I think that's serious goods. But we've been shown up in, in terms of the reality of our country, the two nations in this country. Mm -hmm. The second one, we've been shown up in terms of uh, what I call the weakest link. I think South Africa stays geographically in, in one of the most difficult spaces in terms of public health. If you look at the borders that are porous, and I wanted to bring that into this discussion, that whatever it is we do as South Africa, whatever superb planning we do, I think we're going to be shown up in how we relate to the, the neighboring countries in terms of the porous borders that we have. I was just reflecting on that because the, the last WhatsApp I watched was about how countries are going to be effective in dealing with this pandemic, like the 1918 flu, 16 million people were decimated in that flu. So it is more than public health. It is way beyond health. It is so much more than public health. It is about economics, it's about families, it's about individuals, but it's about relationships that we have and collaborations that we have with other countries neighboring states that we have, especially on this continent. And acknowledging the fact that we are a superpower, we're a little bit more able than other countries on this continent and how we act will show up our leadership at this time in history. It, I mean, it's really amazing to listen to the range, the scope and the depth of each of our speakers and, and these different perspectives that you're bringing in how we puzzle fit our perspective, our, our, you know, collective perspective on social impact, uh, on social cohesion, how it's being impacted by this, um, by, this, by this pandemic effectively. In order for us to be useful, I think 
you know, and I always say that this, this time for us is a moment for us to transition from platitude to practice. Because it's very easy in times of normality to say we believe a certain thing or we are this kind of human being and, and here's our, here are our set of values or here is our set of values. But when time comes for us to, um, to really test that, uh, it's a very different thing that you hear. And I think that's the challenge for a lot of people whose humanity is being tested, empathy for, for other people is being tested, um, or even just their values inside their homes are being tested. Uh, and I think I wanna maybe talk a little bit more acutely now as we open up the discussion. And what I'd love is if you wanna, if you wanna just add something in the chat and just say, I wanna make a comment or I wanna add something in, because it'd be very hard for us to talk over each other, just do it in the chat, in the chat box. There's some naughtiness happening in the chat. I don't, know, I don't even wanna acknowledge that. But you just keep your comments in and I will go straight to those. Um, but if we can, just even with your hand, just raise it quickly and I'll, I'll quickly come to you if you want to drop in a perspective. But let's talk about, and, and maybe it, it kind of pivots off what Rocky was talking about, the psychology um, of people in a prolonged lockdown, which also feeds into how we're able to socially be, be socially cohesive in that context. So maybe just a perspective from, you know, we can, we can start, uh, Raj, since you spoke first, we haven't heard from you in a few minutes. Maybe you can go first from your perspective, what happens to social cohesion in a period of prolonged lockdown? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think all the points are very valid. Right? There's two things that I observed during this lockdown period and during this crisis. Firstly, the unscrupulous nature of humanity where people have used this whole coronavirus issue to try to make a killing in terms of uh, raising prices and so on. Now that is so, so unnecessary. The people are really desperate to purchase goods, necessities and so on, and suddenly prices were rocking sky. And also with the issue about face masks, et cetera. By the time it reaches the South African shores, because we do not have the capacity to manufacture those face masks here. There's so many people on the value chain. So by the time it reaches here, those masks are so exorbitant. Now that showed the bad side of humanity, where people used this coronavirus or COVID-19 issue to make a quick killing. That was the negative things. However, from a positive point of view and from a psychological point of view, like you question, the lockdown has contributed towards a moral regeneration of society. Previously, families were totally distanced from each other. Families or children were strangers to the parents. Each one was doing their own thing. Uh, the father was, uh, when he reaches from work, you will go and watch soccer on TV. The mother will watch a soap operas. The children will watch, play games and so on. But this lockdown has brought the family unit together. I have seen on social media, on Facebook and so on, beautiful pictures of family cooking together, baking together, where people are not buying anything from fast food outlets and so on because it's not available. So they are doing it themselves. Children, uh, the, there's a transmission of knowledge where parents or mothers are teaching the children how to bake and so on. Now that was to me such a warm feeling where people were helping one another and they were building family bondages. And that was uh, contributing to the moral regeneration of society. Furthermore, I have seen some very, very prominent groups like the Gift of the Givers, and there's an organization called the Tamil Business Warriors in, uh, in, in South Africa. They've all been buying things and they were distributing it free to the public. Why? Because they were helping society. It reminds me, I was recently in Australia and I had some interesting tales about the bushfire where people forgot which religion they belong to or which cultural group they belong to. But when the bushfires were there, they all got together and contributed financially or moral support and so on to ensure. Now, this is what's happening in South Africa, where people are getting together, they're forgetting about religion, they're forgetting about language and so on, and they are coming together to help one another from a psychological point of view. And for the purpose of social cohesion, right? 
people. There's, 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 there's like a face group a page called South African Musicians Against COVID-19, where every day since the lockdown started, there's about five artists per day that's performing. And all over the world, people are watching these performances. Performances where people are, uh, where a platform has been created for people to showcase the talent. And in this way, there was exposure. And, and, and that to me was a brilliant way of uh, working towards finding meaningful solutions to overcome the lockdown. It can be very boring. Some people may say, no, the children are bored, this, that, and the other. But if you find innovative ways to keep people occupied, do not, for the sake of, do not allow the children to watch TV the whole day. However, work out a time schedule with uh, some hours can be spent on school work some hours on family time and then leisure. Nothing will be wrong. So, so this was happening during this uh, 12 days and I'm convinced over the past uh, next few days, even more innovative strategies will be adopted by family members, etc. Rather than finding excuses that things that I've seen people for the first time started gardening, planting uh, certain vegetables and spices and so on in the yards. All this was because they had an opportunity to pause and reflect on the important role that they play as a family member. All right, but here's the thing, Dr. Govindan, and I want to throw this open uh, to the rest of our panelists, just indicate with your hand if you, if you want to make your comment first, is that what you describe is so beautiful. Part of it I'm, I'm experiencing in my own family, just being able to have that FaceTime and that eye contact. But what I am acutely, very sort of, you know, really acutely aware of is that that is a class privilege. I am able to work because I have access to Wi-Fi and I have access to um, a computer. I have all the things that I need to, to almost try and mimic the life that I had, even if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm being innovative around it. That is a privilege many families, especially working class families in our country and around the world, do not have. I and mean, I was watching video today of hawkers who were trying to go back into the streets to ply their trade because they depend on the daily income to sustain their families. And if they hadn't got those permits, of course, they were getting into trouble. So there's that need to balance legislation in a disaster context with the need for people who might somehow fall through the cracks. So this, this, this beautiful picture that we're sharing is a picture that can only be shared by a certain you know, a certain number of us in society and a very small number, the majority of people are out there very highly exposed. And I'd love for our panelists, and you know, if you want to raise your hand, I think Shabnam, you, you want to go, you want to go next? Did I see you correctly? Sure. Maybe just share sure. you know, and, and, and reflect on that, on that real reality in our country. Of course. Uh, thanks, Iman. Our country has the largest gap between the elite and the rest in the world. Uh, and that's a historical uh, struggle as well as a struggle of the issues that we're still facing 26 years later. And you're quite right, where some of us have access to the internet, we have access to cell phones, we have access to data, which is wonderful. And of course, what we use to do with it has got to be positive and it's got to make an impact. The reality is that most people um, in our country don't have those luxuries. They're struggling for food. The homeless are being displaced from one place to another. At one point, we saw more deaths from police and army brutality than we were seeing from COVID-19. Uh, and our people are reminded of the days of apartheid, the kind of brutalities that they're experiencing. But speaking about brutality, the other uh, you know, sector of society massively affected by the lockdown is victims of gender-based violence who are trapped in their homes with abusers, predominantly women, predominantly children who are affected by it. And from the reports that we're getting on the ground in my work with gender-based violence victims is that they get to court and they're told, well, we're only seeing people till one o'clock. One o'clock arrives, the person sitting from 10 a.m. and does not get any relief and goes back into that same environment, is unable to make a call. Neighbors, you know, are becoming more aware of what gender-based violence is, so they're more willing to get involved. But sometimes they still just, should I get involved? If I go in the system, am I going to be arrested because I was outside of my home? So that's a very serious issue. And the other area where class comes in, uh, Iman, is education where we're trying to do online teaching. I work at the CFAD, we're trying to do online teaching with our students. 
And it's difficult because not all of them have mobile technology and data, et cetera. So even in education, we were seeing a class divide because if we're between those get access online education and those that cannot. And certainly this is going to completely damage our economy for a long while to come. While the 1% is certainly going to benefit, the rest of us are going to be feeling the impact and which is why we need to find alternative strategies of making sure that economic policies we develop ourselves work for the 99%. Because if social cohesion is going to mean anything, it must be rooted in the African principle of umuntu gomuntu gabantu, I am because you are. And as Africans, that's what we have to offer to the world. Right, well, Catherine, I think that's what you were reflecting on is how th that, that kind of, and I, I would call it a positive altruism because you do get negative altruism that is about the individual, their profile, their status being amplified through doing acts of charity. But talk to us about the positive altruism that you're seeing where people are definitely aware of the exposure of, 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 of people and families and how they can reach out and help. And I, I think that's an important message that, that people need to, that that is happening even in a context of exclusion and isolation. Mm. I, I definitely I have to say that there's so many, uh, you know, we are all on so many different WhatsApp groups. We are sitting on different boards and through a lot of the engagement and the interaction that I've seen happening, people genuinely want to help. I think that there has been a lot of opportunity for people as they've had to stop doing what they do and sit at home. People are taking in a lot more content, they are sitting in front of their TVs, and they see real life reality of South Africans who, you know, the media is on the ground, they're going into communities, and we're able to understand the actual truth behind how South Africans are living. And that is the majority of South Africans that are living in townships, that are living in rural areas, and that do not have access to the basic human rights that they should have access to, like safe clean drinking water. There are communities that now for the first time are getting access to safe clean drinking water because of COVID. They should have had drinking water 15 years ago, but they don't. And I think it's really important that we understand that there are people that are out on the ground every single day through NGOs and through really amazing initiatives that are doing what they're doing in order to bridge that divide, even if it is just for that one day, that moment, but you see aid going into communities and people are there genuinely to do good. And I think it's important for people to ask the question, to understand that when this is over, what is it that you can do from the corners that you stand every single day? Because what we fundamentally forget is that we continue with our lives as if, you know, we, we live in a silo and we don't. South Africans, you know, when we when we go into an office space, do we truly understand what kind of circumstances the people who are sitting around the table, the people that are working in that office, what kind of circumstances they come from? How many taxis they had to take to get to work? Did they have to fetch water at five o'clock in the morning so that their family had water before they left to come to work? We don't understand the circumstances of fellow South Africans. And we need to start breaking down those very barriers in our own direct spaces. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing. Don't worry about what government is doing. Ask yourself, do you actually understand the other? The person who sits in the office across from you or the person that you sign in at the security points at your office building every day and you go upstairs. Do you know who that person is? Do you truly understand their circumstances? We have to start to break down those barriers and ask ourselves, do we truly understand? And when we start to understand, we will know, we will have better information and we got to do better as individuals. We can't wait for government. We can't just wait for NGOs. We have to ask ourselves, what is it that we do to be active and engaged citizens on a daily basis? Well, this is really the question about whether this is, um, you know, event related, this outpouring of solidarity, even though it has its physical limitations, but either contributing to, uh, you know, funds or causes, volunteering to help in certain circumstances. Dr. Diawa, you spoke, and, and we know this concept well in South Africa, you know, coined by former President uh, Thabo Mbeki about the two nation concept of, of how we live in South Africa, the people are having a you know, two country experience, the haves and the, and the haves not. Is this an opportunity for us to significantly breach that, you know, or make that, you know, close, close the gaps 
in that reality? Is this a real oh, opportunity to do exactly. that? Or is it just an event? Yeah. I wrote down here that the success of this lockdown should be measured by how it positively impacts on the less privileged in our communities. When all is done, our success as a country and how we impacted on this should be measured. Our standard and our bar is not middle class. It's how we dealt with the less privileged. I think Catherine touched on that. So the second thing is, we should also, I think, emerge from this, hopefully, as better human beings in how we relate to others amongst us, the ones that we work with. And I think Catherine's point, I agree with, because we are all employers. And I'm hearing really disturbing issues where people are cooked up in their middle class homes and expecting people to come to work. For what purpose? And I think it's really showing us up at a very basic human level and the, the hoarding of foodstuffs so that poorer people who can't buy bulk have no access to foodstuffs. So I think as an individual and at an individual level, we have two choices. The first choice is to become really human and use this as an opportunity because I think every calamity in history offers us an opportunity to sit down and reflect as an individual, how are you going to come out with this? So the first choice is to become a better person and how you understand those that you work with that work for you, et cetera, et cetera. Or you go the survival route, which means you hold everything around yourself and hope that whatever happens around you doesn't affect you. So for me, I think the hope and the sustainability of this Kumbaya period, and we had a little bit of that during the World Cup, is that we sustain it. So we use the opportunities and the lessons that come out of this for the things that we could have done better for our communities, to sustain them going forward and take that as a way to plan further for another calamity that will surely come after this one. And that's important is the opportunity to build a different kind of legacy in the same way that our collective psyches are being impacted and changed, our behavioral patterns, both in the way that we work and interact are being changed. This is an opportunity in the depths of this crisis to leave a legacy for, for survival and success after this period has passed. Because I think as all of you have reflected quite consistently, the ramifications, the consequences of what we're experiencing now on so many different stri striatic levels are going to be with us for much longer. I want to take just a moment before I invite Rocky to, to make some comments. Uh, Rocky, just bear with me for just one second. I want to read some of the comments that um, our, our viewers, our listeners are sharing with us. Anonymous attendee says, the lockdown has once again shown up the extreme inequality in our country. The fact that a number of families and companies can have a billion to contribute is sickening. Does this not provide us with the time to have a sort of codessa on economic transformation, um, where the rich recognize they will have to give up their wealth or have it taken through revolution, where we jointly look at another way of organizing our economy and society? For a lot of people, those, those, that perspective you know, can be jarring, but it is real. And um, you know, as a radio host, listening to a, a lot of people express their frustration about the concentration of wealth, not only in our country, but in many other countries where the economic divide is chasmic and, and really quite stupendous. Um, you know, these, these comments and, and these perspectives abound, they have to be taken seriously. And we do have to do a lot of introspection about how we flatten the curve on economic inequality while we try and flatten the curve on, 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 on the infection rate uh, on COVID-19. I want to also share from Cyan, uh, there were two perspectives Cyan shared, which were, were really, really interesting. Uh, but there's so many comments coming in, so it keeps kicking me out and scrolling me back down. Um, let me just see if I can get to and hold my cursor on here. Pubendra Akia says, regards um, gender violence. Um, okay, again, it's very hard for me to, to stay on, on a thought because it keeps scrolling up and down. Um, so I was talking about whether we can... Sorry, go ahead, who's Sorry, that? Sorry, go ahead, who's that? Okay, maybe, maybe it's the Lord telling me I'm hearing the sound of my own voice. There's a, an echo coming back to me. <laughs> okay, let me pause there. Uh, Rocky, you come in. Um, there, there's a lot that is changing, not because we want it to change, but because we're feeling the shock of having to change. So there's legislation in the Dis Disaster Management Act that is requiring us to stay home, requiring us to restrict our movements, um, it's having, as we discussed right at the outset, um, you know, a deep psychological impact in our behavioral patterns inside our homes. And I'd like for you to share, um, again, to tease out that idea, 
to the point that some of our panelists are making about irrevocable change from a psychological perspective once this is over, even though we don't know when it will be. I think that it's, it's a little bit of a pity that it's taken a pandemic for us to come to so many realizations of ourselves and to think about the other. Uh, however, be it as it might, just the fact that we've done it, we've, this has got to continue. There should not become a time where we forget about the lessons learned. Do you know, we've spoken about community groups that we've seen. I've seen a lot of empathy, a lot of people reaching out, a lot of selfless people really wanting to help because for the first time, even though these inequalities have always existed, for the first time, many people are a lot more mindful about the other. So we need to continue. A lot of the time we, we focus on what we can't change, what we can't control. Questions like what is the government doing or what is going to happen? The more we focus on what we cannot control, the more anxious we'll be, the unhappier we'll be, the more overwhelmed we'll be. And if we can bring the focus back to ourselves as individuals, as families, and at smaller groups to ask, well, what change can I make? What can I change, positive change can I start to make? And if we had to all think in this way, then there would be a greater positive change than everyone sitting back and wondering, well, what is the government going to do? Or what is going to happen in general? So we've got to take the focus away from what will happen, what we can't control, bring it back to what we can control, and we don't need to be policed. So many of the questions have been asked and it kind of irked me on social media, what is the first thing you're going to do after the lockdown? And I was saddened to see some of the results or some of the replies like I'm going to McDonald's or these things made me sad because I realized that so, it, this hasn't hit home for many people. Uh, I'm going to do nothing different really, that I'm doing right now, if I'm, I'm definitely not rushing back to anything that I've done before because it's made me really mindful. So even if the lockdown is lifted and I don't even want to get into a debate about when or, or whether that might happen anytime soon, but we should not have to be policed about doing what is the responsible thing for ourselves and for our fellow brothers and sisters. The responsible thing needs to be done, not just because there's a law or there's a disaster management act that says you cannot leave your home or you need to social distance. That is something we need to be mindful of. The pandemic is going nowhere anytime soon. If anything, uh, I hope I'm wrong, but it seems like the worst is still to come. So we need to act responsibly in our own lives by protecting ourselves and protecting everyone else in our behavior, in our homes, and when we do go out into the world. But here's the thing, and um, okay, Raj, coming, coming real quick, and then I'll share some comments, and then I want you to think about, as Raj prepares to speak, that again, we're speaking from the perspective of those who, who can comply with the law, to stay home, to not work, and to, to desist from social interaction. When just this morning on the news, you'll watch again, hawkers and a lot of other people who are just worried about that day's pay to take care of their family and keep them fed that day. That the kind of luxuries that we have to think about our place in the world, think about being altruistic, are luxuries that are not available to the majority of people who have this real concern every day. Raj, go. But basically, what I was looking at the way forward, like you asked, what happens after this whole pandemic, right? For example, during this period, municipalities in various parts of the country have been establishing temporary shelters where people, homeless people, were given an opportunity to sleep for the first time on a mattress with a sheet and a blanket and a pillow and were given a proper meal. Now, these people were shocked because this was the first time they've experienced this. So what I'm saying is, post-pandemic, post-COVID-19, we need to go back to the drawing board and find meaningful opportunities to ensure that what we have done for the homeless during this period is sustained so that proper facilities are provided for the homeless going forward so that they can continuously sleep on a uh, mattress, have a proper food uh, meal, because the NGOs alone could not do enough. Government have found money. They've, they've, they've sacrificed, they've got donations and so on, and they've provided for these people. So now going forward, we need to relook, government need to relook at its expenditure trends and prioritize on ensuring that the citizenry of South Africa is comfortable. If it could be done during this period, 
it can be done going forward. So that is one thing that is very important. And another thing is that people have totally disregarded the president's call for social distancing, washing hands and so on. People are still going, having bribes and so on. We need to be serious because if we are not serious now, this pandemic can go on and, and the lockdown can be extended for many more months. And, and that is a frightening issue. So if we listen to the president, they've taken a very, very important decision. So much so that he has suspended one of the ministers uh, uh, today uh, for uh, violating the lockdown procedures. So if, if the president is serious with regard to this, we as the citizenry of, of South Africa, we need to cooperate so that we can fight this thing in the principle in the, in the, in the principle of Ubuntu. Well, well, here's the thing. I mean, you talk about that arrest. And, and, and again, another point I'd like to add, which shows the disparity in how the response to those who are breaking the conventions and the rules has been, it's, it's not been even handed. I mean, you think about um, the communications minister there on suspension, two months suspension, one month, I think, without pay. And then you think about the Nongoma couple who had their wedding. It was Nongoma, it was somewhere in KZN. I might get the town mm. wrong. Um, who were bundled into a police vehicle at their wedding because they broke the conventions by having a wedding party with more than 50 people. So they were arrested and bundled off and you, you have a minister who was suspended. Um, and so again, there's a very stark example right now about how different people are being cheated. Think about that, kids, for, for just a second. I'm just going to read some comments. And Pee Wee and Klantler on, um, on the chat says, thank you very much to the knowledgeable, insightful, insightful panel and socially cohesive society the pandemic has brought about a sense of moral responsibility and a society united around a common purpose indeed it all begins with a sense of responsibility what can i do moving forward and learning from the 2010 world cup social cohesion and downward decline how do we maintain the sense of unity taking into consideration poverty implications and i think dr dr you referenced that a little bit earlier maybe you can reinforce that point Aidan uh, Inal says, um, from Pampilia Hlapa, what in your view is the most important survival quality that you need to enable people to move forward past this crisis? Do most individuals in our society possess those qualities? If not, how do we empower them? Um, who would like to, to come in on that? Otherwise, uh, Dr. Dia, I'm going to come to you and then Catherine, you're welcome to come in. I think Piwi makes a very good point because I think the biggest fear already, which one shouldn't really address, is the anxiety around how continuity of social cohesion and building a strong nation. I think this is the biggest opportunity at a national level we've been given once again as South Africa to sustain those good programs that we had. So social cohesion comes to mind. We started very well. And it's just gone very quiet. And I think we should, uh, we should address this challenge as reflecting on how we take this forward, but in a more sustainable way. We can't do this as events. It has to be a program of action. How do we bring the less, um, the poor people in our communities back into the fold? Because I think that they are continuously going to be the weakest link. It doesn't matter how successful we think we are. I think the biggest risk any nation faces, including our own, is the lack of inclusiveness of people, as we've seen on our television stations, of how do we include the informal commerce that you see on the streets? There has to be a way of doing that. And at the back of this uh, pandemic, how do, we, how do we build sustainable programs? I think that is the biggest challenge we have. Correct. Sustainability. Catherine? I want to just add and just say that all of this is, is so important. And the one thing that I realize more and more is that South Africa does not have a civic education in place. And so it's very hard. South Africans don't know how to be good citizens. We don't know what it is that we we live because of the social ills in our society we live behind high walls we live with barriers between us because of fear um, and so we don't know what it means to be a, a civic society that's really engaged and I think there are great lessons that are coming out of this um, well, well, to you, though, Catherine, are you saying but is that class specific because people might argue you know, in communities like the one that I come from in Kittimaritzburg or in, in Phoenix, in, in KZN, um, you know, when there's a funeral, the community is expected to bring, you know, to bring their help. They'll help heal things or they'll contribute to the food. And people feel very engaged. 
this kind of almost selfish existence, is it a class thing? Just want to clarify. Uh, I'm talking about civic education as a, as from a, a nationwide blanket perspective. In schools, we don't talk, we don't teach children civic education. We have life orientation where they're taught a whole lot of other things, but we're not teaching people how to actively engage in society. For example, and so I'm not specifically talking from a class perspective. There are cultural elements to this as well. So exactly what you're saying, coming from a community where everyone gets involved and does things, that is very culturally linked to different parts of our country as well. But for example, how many people in our country know who their ward councillor is? How many of them know how to report a broken light or running water? Instead, we go to social media, we complain, we take photos, we replace them there, thinking that that's going to fix the problem. Instead of engaging the system that exists for us to report things, for us to engage with people who are actually within the system there to help us, we're sitting in our corner and we just point fingers. We don't know how to be engaged as citizens. And so I'm talking about civic education from a very broad perspective where children as part of the curriculum, even in, in, in the workplace, as part of the, um, you know, I don't know what division in, in the workplace it would be, but people need to be socialized in the perspective that we start to implement civic education, getting people to understand that it doesn't matter who you are, you have a role to play. You are responsible as a citizen to building this country, no matter where you come from. And I think that people need to understand that each and every citizen has a responsibility in building the country that we believe in. We need to understand where we come from, but we need to have a shared vision of where we want to move to. All right, I'll get Shabnam's uh, perspective in just a second. Let's go back to the comments. And uh, Cyan Alves says, thank you to the panelists for their insightful input. I've got two points of reflection I'd like you to comment on. The first is the very real reality of COVID and the negative impact on the economy. Those repercussions are just on the horizon. In some countries, there's a call for a basic income for all, leniency around debt and rent, executives reducing their own salaries to cover the salaries of lower paid staff. These are examples that would allow some measure of relief and economic recovery. What are your thoughts on this point? I'm gonna go quickly to Cyan. Second point is to question what extent we are creating meaningful and authentic cohesion in a society where according to the inequality report from Stats SA, colored and black communities live in poverty with little or no access to the internet when compared to their Indian and white counterparts. So there's tension between authentic cohesion, which is premised on the equitable labor practice and economic policies that favor the poor. The poor. Could the panelists reflect on this? I think let's just maybe start, and Shabram, if you want to comment on this particular question, I invite you to do so. But let me go back to this because I think it's really important. We do know that we're already working. Um, if you look at the expanded definition of um, unemployment in South Africa, just before we went into this crisis, actually touching on close to the 40% mark, that is a significant amount of people um, whose labor is excluded from being part of the active economy. If you look at countries like America, the projections are around 32%, double digit unemployment in the months to come. And, and, and they were working off a lower base than we did in South Africa. So the prospects for our economic unemployment projections in South Africa are potentially catastrophic. So that's something that's coming and we're going to need to prepare for it. So maybe just go to Cyan's uh, question. It's um, how, do we, how do we create these measures for relief and economic recovery? Now, I know that none of you, my panelists, as far as I know, are economic, economists. So this, you know, this might be just more of a reflective answer from your perspective, but if anyone wants to come in on that, you're welcome to. Shabnam, you have the microphone. Absolutely. I think from an activist perspective, it, we have a lot of experience in analyzing and debating the state of economic policies, which are neoliberal and always have been, you might as well call them neo-colonial at this stage and designed to maintain the status quo of the 1% against the rest. So absolutely, I agree with Cyan's uh, comment that we do need, we need a basic income. We need um, for the hawkers not to be working at this time. Initially, I thought, why are they not being allowed to work? And then when they were, I thought, okay, that's a small victory. But I've realized they shouldn't have to work. They shouldn't have to be exposing themselves to getting ill and being afraid whether they're going to take that illness back to their family. But the reason is because we're living in this virus called capitalism, which is forcing people to not have health care, to not have proper housing, to not have proper education. 
and those are the struggles that we're actually facing. If I were to talk about achieving social cohesion, we would not be able to achieve it without social solidarity. So that doesn't only mean supporting the hawker by buying their fruits and vegetables as opposed to going to the big conglomerates that are GMO infested. No, it goes beyond that. It means agitating with them when their rights are violated. I mean, I live in the middle of the CBD. When I see the Metro Police coming to attack our hawkers and take their goods, I get involved. I make a noise. I take photographs. I take videos. I take it to social media because I can do that. They don't have that voice. It goes beyond giving charity to the homeless or a meal for a week and feeling good about yourself. It's great. It's good to be, feel good about yourself. You're doing something. But it goes beyond that to agitating for them to have actual homes. The kind of comments we saw on social media, the privileged comments, look at these idiots uh, out there standing in their lines outside shop, right? These are poor people that had not gotten paid yet that were there trying to shop with the little money that they had. The conversation seems to have shifted a little bit. I think there's a lot of awareness coming out from these communities, from activists that are saying, but this is the reason why. So there is a shift away. And I certainly think the ruling class has got a lot to worry about in terms of what kind of country are we going to expect afterwards? Seeing the kind of service delivery that's trickling in now, we're going to say, well, that's possible, why not do it? But coming back finally to Catherine's comment on civic education, I agree. We need that in our schools. We need our little kids from crash states to be able to grow food so that we're not dependent on the conglomerates. But beyond civic education and complaining to counselors who by and large are highly problematic, yes, they're the good ones, we need to become activists, develop our own programs and our own projects that are going to uplift our community and take, it, take us out of complaining and a place of negativity into a place of empowerment and solidarity with each other. Oh, I hate the clock. It's nine minutes after eight and uh, we're meant to end round about now or at least in the next five minutes. But I really want to bring in some of the comments from people who are watching live. And uh, then Raj, I'll bring you and, and, and Rocky in. Uh, anonymous attendee says uh, there are two responses to the situation. Individual altruism, which we touched on lightly, where we contribute to alleviating the direct suffering of particular people while a systemic approach where we seek ways to implement an, a transformation of our society. The question is, how do we really address the systemic problems we have when there are such disparities between rich, um, white and black and poor black? Is there a clear way? And, and I think this is, this is one of those, those questions that have had a unicorn-like answer in our economy since the advent of from apartheid. Some of those which have become more reinforced in, in, in democracy. Um, and so I don't know. Again, it goes to some of the points that you raised. And Zondile Kumano says, interesting discussion by the panelists. I'm more interested in the possibility of new knowledge in general that begins to emerge from the dialogue and, of course, uh, and of course taking a responsive approach. I'm asking myself, and Zondile is, is it time to review the monomers of what makes a socially cohesive society? And if really our current setup as a country is working for our communities, there's so much dependence on government and less responsibility on members of our great rainbow nation. I'm interested in hearing what impact the advocates envisage for South Africa in a more future centric projection. And uh, Willem van Rijsbeek, you can take notes by the way, these are brilliant questions. Uh, Willem van Rijsbeek is saying politicians are being shown up as to who and what they are, warts and all. We have become more aware of the plight of the poor and the extent of the problem. Constructive criticism is required, tempered with empathy, but no mercy for the really stupid. And um, for Dr. Diao, please share your opinion on whether South Africa was more prepared than the global north to manage COVID, given that South Africa has been managing comorbid chronic disease for many years. So let's use that as our jump off point, and then we'll go to Raj and we'll go to Rocky. Go ahead. Okay, That's I know that we are coming to an end towards this very interesting discussion. Just two things that I want to bring to your attention or to the viewers' attention. This whole pandemic, has contributed towards xenophobic tendencies of some people. If you read the tone of WhatsApp messages, as well as in Facebook comments and so on, where people were, for example, saying, good, USA is suffering because they're always dominating the world. And now the numbers are increasing, the deaths are high there. So uh, same thing with our attitude towards the Chinese, where people are blaming the Chinese with all those theories that they have uh, concocted. However, this is a global pandemic. We are all part of this global citizenship and humanity. We need to all work together 
to find meaningful solutions that's going to benefit the global community. By doing this, we will be leaving behind a legacy, a legacy that 2020 was a very, very difficult year for the entire global nation. And we've come together in such a good way to find meaningful solutions to help one another to overcome this. And the second point that I would like to make, and I would like to expand on what uh, both Raki and Shabnam has mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, Catherine and Shabnam has mentioned, civic education. Yes, we have life orientation at school where some teachers meaningfully use life orientation to teach some good things to the children. However, some use it as free periods where children can do their homework and so on. We need to take life orientation. Okay, I don't know if that's my connection. Oh, it's Dr. Gabriel. Yes, are you, are you there? Yeah. Right, we got you. So I'm saying that civic education is paramount. This has brought a wake-up call to the rest of the world. We need to educate our children how to overcome situations like this and how we as humanity need to work together to find common solutions. That civic education coupled with social cohesion and nation building issues and so on. So the curriculum developers of the education system in South Africa, both basic and higher education, need to now relook at the curriculum and expand on life orientation to include civic education, social cohesion, and nation building, and so on, to prepare our children for the future. This was a real wake-up call. And, and I think there's some lots of positive things that emanated from right. this, and we need to work towards it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that. And I think it leads to uh, Rocky's, uh, to a point I'd like to raise with Rocky, because we're slowly winding down. Um, when, we, when we think about um, how much we are being changed as a society, Part of what I think is interesting is the very real observation of people, you know, people who might have been blind to how other people live in, in society, what their challenges might have been, are suddenly getting a very real education on how the other half lives or the other majority lives in our country. Do, do you think, I mean, what, what is your perspective on that changing psychology and our own pathologies around just what kind of society we, we were a part of, Raki? Like I said, it's it's a pity that it's taken a pandemic for us to be more mindful of these things. So what's important and what I've been uh, advocating to many people to do is to really journal about this time on a daily basis about what you're going through, what you're experiencing, what you're noticing and learning about others. Because there should never come a time where we forget what we've learned during this time. We don't want to get to a time, even if it's a year down the line where we're so comfortable in our not past normal lives again, that we forget what we've learned and how we can contribute positively. So we want to use the change, the new knowledge, the new learnings we have to, to roll out change and to inform. So to use our own position. So wherever we have influence, whatever different fields we have influence is to inform positive change, to inform transformation for the future and how um, we can plan differently in our different sectors, uh, how we can help this. This is not going to be the last pandemic, for example. Uh, so we want to use what we've learned now to create solutions for the future. Our focus for too long has been on problems and we need to move from a problem fo uh, focus to a bigger solution focus. So we feel that we are moving along, we're progressing and we're not stuck in this. Doctor, thank you very much, uh, Rocky. Dr. Diao, there was a specific question for you. I don't know if you still have, okay, go ahead. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. I think I'd like to think that this country is particularly led, if you go back 25 years of HIV response, we, we truly led and we how South Africa reacted to the HIV pandemic, and then we're able in the end to run out one of the biggest programs in the world. What HIV brought us as a country is the, the incompetences of the system, the health system. And I think we're slowly working us towards tightening that. So I think our level of readiness is a little bit better than 25 years ago. The second point I'd like to make is the role of civil society. We must never forget the power and the role that civil society played in that. And I think we shouldn't forget them, therefore, in taking forward the, the responses that come out and the lessons that come out of this um, pandemic. The, the last point I'd like to make and a request really is that in reacting to, 
to pandemics like this. We must remember that communities and people who are poor, they are not things or people that we do things to. They have inherent capacity to think and they have systems that they have used, be those cultural or systems as you responded earlier about things like funerals and things. Communities have ways of responding to crises. And I think lessons that have to come out of this is going back to that initial way of how communities are resilient or build resilience to disasters and take those as lessons. I think maybe this is the result of this experiment that we've all been thrown into uh, against our wills, is, is how we build these new ways of, of connecting, even in the deepest of, of crises. Um, Catherine, I'm going to give you a minute. I'm going to give uh, Shabnam a minute. I'm going to read one or two more comments, and then I'm going to hand it back to Ihan. Go ahead, Catherine. I would just wrap up by saying, you know, we, we never can have a conversation about South Africa and place outside of our mind the real context of South Africans. We can never um, be in a deep conversation that is meaningful and not understand that we're talking about a country that is divided in two. And so I think that it's really important that where, where it is that you are, you have certain platforms, you have access to certain uh, resources, be it just your mobile, the data you have, you may be watching this from your home, that means you have a laptop or you're connected to data and it's important. Let us make sure that we're using our platforms to share good because it's in this time where people are in a space of fear, of worry, anxiety, that they start to get stuck in um, the, the craziness of what we share on social media. So be responsible with what it is that you're sharing and be deliberate in what you share on these platforms that you have access to. And when we come out of this, because we will come out of this, ask yourself what it is that you can do to be a better South African citizen. Ask yourself not only what kind of South Africa do we want, but what kind of South African do we want as well. Thanks, Catherine. Shabnam, you, you get the last face-to-face um, -face word before I share some online comments. Thanks, Iman. I want to pick up on what Dr. Diao had said about communities being resilient. And yes, they have solutions, they have the wisdom, they have the know-how. Nothing for us without us is a phrase that we use within the activism space. We cannot impose our solutions on people, whether they're the homeless or gender-based violence victims or anyone that is suffering on, in this time. It has to be through a process of consultation and through a process of um, of, uh, of mediation. And the last point is of asking questions, which is what Catherine was speaking to. Some of us are so afraid to rock the boat, even in our social media, and to ask those tough questions, because what are people going to say if we present an unpopular opinion and move away from this kumbaya, let's ignore all the problems, let's be perpetually smiling and happy, and all the problems will go away. You get attacked when you even try to say something critical. But dissent is the highest form of patriotism. If we want social cohesion, we need dissent, we need critical voices, we need practical action, and we need social solidarity. Amandla to that. Uh, I, I, I wait to that because, as you're saying, I mean, what you're talking to has at its base and axis tolerance. Uh, and that is something that we, I, I think it's a language we understand, or we're beginning to understand better and better as South Africans. All right, to end with a few comments, Michael Samuel, and I need to uh, really put on my, my reading glasses for this one and get out my dictionary. But it's a really great perspective, while correctly so. The focus in the educational terrain has been on the access of learner students to alternative learning and development opportunities. I wish to alert us to acknowledge the great learning challenges that teachers and lecturers too have to make as they embrace new pedagogical modes that they are unacclimatized to and as they seek to find alternative productive, creative, imaginative, qualitative, deep learning opportunities. We all are vulnerable and are co-learning as we move out of habits or conventional rituals. Michael, that comment really resonates hard, especially now when we're looking at how we can transition in an e-learning or digital, digital learning capacity and, and just you know, where our shortcomings are in that space. So that's a really great comment. Um, anonymous attendees agreeing with Catherine around civic education. Um, anonymous attendees says, thank you, Iman and the panelists. In order for many NGOs to reach their population or clients and provide support they need data or airtime, that is to look at a way to provide data-free platforms or pl providing data at a reasonable price so that conversations 
and support with these poorer communities can take place during the lockdown. So many more comments. Um, uh, Aiden is saying a huge thank you to all of the panelists, and I think that's where I will catch my breath and and place pause, hit the pause button on our conversation. It's been a pleasure to have all of you. I know that needs to be excavated a little bit more so that we come away with a more complex and useful understanding around some of the issues that you raised. It's been my pleasure hosting all of you this evening. Ihan, I would love to hand it back to you. Thank you, Iman. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we sincerely, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much. We really appreciate your insights. I think we have enough food to think about and reflect. So during the rest of the lockdown, uh, I think we should come together again, maybe in two weeks, three weeks time. Uh, yes, Iman? Just, I think, I think, you know, to end on a really beautiful sort of ramp, ramping, you know, sentiment. And this is from Andrew Lindsay, which I thought was a really beautiful perspective that he brought maybe as, as an end point. It is a relationship between between ourselves as humans, but we mustn't forget our broader relationship with the earth and how we are living here, how we have messed up the world with pollution and exploiting nature, destroying. I think we're live, but I had this frozen. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Am I here? Oh no, yes. Okay, this, this conversation doesn't want to end itself, so I'm going to make an executive decision and say thank you all for, for being with us. We appreciate you. Please be safe.